All right, I'll save everyone the torture for those of you that just can't stand that song. It's Sunday evening, it's Easter for those of you that observe it. Happy Easter, uh, everyone. I hope you all are doing well in quarantine, shelter in place, or you don't give a flip, whatever it is to you. I hope you're surviving it. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're enjoying your tank. What we're talking about tonight, how fitting. Quarantine, quarantine, marine fish, and coral. What I call rolling the dice or not. So what we're gonna do tonight is give you a rundown on quarantine. Quarantine is something that is, it's fairly complex from the standpoint. It's not something you're just like, I'm gonna try something and see what I get, and then I'll learn from it. You wanna do your research beforehand. I'm gonna set you up um, so you can be well prepared for it, and I encourage you to digest this information. This is a recording, so you can go back and review it. It's gonna be up for everyone. Please do that. Don't just throw caution to the wind and th or throw things against the wall in terms of your quarantining and see what you get. All right, what is quarantine? Well, the formal definition, because we all love formalities, is a strict isolation imposed to, imposed to prevent the spread of diseases. Kind of like what a lot of us are doing now. You're hopefully hanging out at home, not going out much. If you do, you're being really careful about it. For the most part, you're in one place. You're not letting anyone in. You're not going out. You want to stay on lockdown to keep the disease, in our case right now, COVID-19, away. You don't want it to go in, and if you have it, you don't want it to get out, which is exactly what we're going to do for our saltwater, our saltwater fish and our saltwater coral. Here's the fun part of this talk. It starts off with me eating crow. Not literally because, you know, Ozzy did that, what, 30 years ago now or something? Um, I get to do this because in the sense of the word of eating my own mistake or saying, you know what, I made a mistake. In 2012, I was in Southern California giving a talk at a trade show, and somebody asked me at the end during the Q&A session, they said, do you quarantine your fish? And I said, nah, never have, never had a problem. Fast forward six weeks later, I'm setting up my 235-gallon tank, and I've got fish in it, which I didn't quarantine because I've never had a problem. And marine velvet, if you don't know what that is, we'll talk about it tonight, gets into the tank and wipes out pretty much all but two of my fish, maybe three. $1,500 down the drain, a whole bunch of heartbreak, and to cap it all off to put the icing on the cake, I got to go on YouTube in front of the whole wide world and say, I messed up. And that video has been viewed 79,000 times. Here's a hint, not that much fun. I don't recommend it. Okay, now some of you are still saying what I said. This hasn't happened to me. Why should I even be concerned? Well, I look at it this way. It may not have happened to you. I hope it doesn't ever happen to you that you get a fish or coral disease in your tank. When it does, it is a very humbling experience. And if I always said it hasn't happened to me, why would I be concerned? Let's look at other areas in our life where if we said that, it just wouldn't make sense. Example, I've never been in a car wreck, ever, but I still wear a seatbelt. If I fall, the it's never happened to me, why would I care mentality? Who needs a seatbelt? I've never been in a car wreck, but I still have insurance. If I fall, the it's never happened to me, so I don't care about it. I wouldn't have car insurance. Here's the thing about car wrecks and quarantining your fish. If you're driving down the interstate at 80, because no one drives 65, um, and you go, you know what? I'm about to have a car wreck. Hang on, and you're gonna pick up your phone, you're gonna pick up your device, because no one follows the law about not, about hands-free, and go, hello, State Farm, I'd like to take out an insurance policy because I'm about to have a wreck. That's not how it goes. It's the same thing with quarantining. You don't know that it's coming. What you do is you want to prevent the risk, you wanna manage that risk, set yourself up for success. So with quarantining, you're managing risk, and then you're dealing with the problem in the terms of fish or coral disease if it happens in a controlled environment. Okay, if you're one of those people who says, it hasn't happened to me, who the flip cares, best of luck. Everyone else who's interested in a different viewpoint, this is what I have to tell you about quarantine. Having been through it for many years, I used to quarantine fish for clients and then send them out if they didn't want to do it. So here's how I look at it 
this is how I approach it. First of all, first thing to know about quarantine is it's a contact sport. Rugby, one of those real sports out there. It is a contact sport. You have to watch your fish or your coral. You have to watch your water parameters. You have to touch the tank and then you have to write down notes. This isn't one of those things where you're like, oh, cool, new fish. It's in the quarantine tank. I'll worry about it in two weeks. Not how this goes, which isn't a bad thing. You got a new arrival. You're likely excited about it. I want you to be excited about it. You want to be spending a lot of time with it, getting to know it and letting it get to know you. Also, quarantine. It's strict isolation, meaning you keep things out of your tank. The two don't intermingle. If you have multiple quarantine tanks, the two tanks don't intermingle. Nothing is in once you start the quarantining process. So my quarantine process is 30 days for fish, 60 days for coral. I'll talk about that in a minute. Let's say you put a fish in May 1, and then a couple weeks goes by, you're on day 25 of your fish quarantine period, and you go, ooh, look at that fish. I'm going to buy that fish and bring him home and put in my quarantine tank. The moment you put that fish in the quarantine tank with the other fish that's been in there for 25 days, the clock resets. It has to be 30 days for the fish, 60 days for the coral, from 60 days of 30 and 60 days of nothing else going in the tank. All right? Nothing goes in once you put the animals in the tank. And the clock starts from when the last animal went in. If you add a new animal in, it resets the clock. All right, let's talk about coral because. Pretty much everyone on these webinars is a reef junkie and you have a reef tank. And I'm willing to bet that you like your corals more than you like your fish. If not, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that, but I'm willing to bet it's this way. The corals get us addicted. Fish people are like, those are cool. Maybe you have a prized fish or two, but you're still like, yeah, it's all about coral though. All right, here's a nice organ tour. Here's one that I'm sure you would love to have in your tank. This is a very happy, healthy coral. Good reason to coral, quarantine your coral is to make them look like that. It looks really good. I'm willing to bet that y'all would like that. And quarantine keeps crap like this is um, Baropsis out of your tank. Get that junk out of there. Have a chance to catch it before it gets in. Same with other nuisance things like bubble algae. All right, you don't want these in. Let's talk about the three amigos. Three pests that you're most likely going to encounter and you want to quarantine against when you're quarantining your coral. First one, Acropora eating flatworms, known as AEFW. Coral eating nudibranchs, that's Montefiore eating nudibranchs and Zoanthid eating nudibranchs. If you're a softy person, I'm sorry, but you're not immune to this. And then red bugs. All right, let's go through each of these so we understand them, because until we understand things, we don't know how to look out for them and handle it, treat them. Acropora eating flatworms, very, very small, nasty boogers. There's a dime, there's an Acropora eating flatworm. Now note this about this slot. That's the animal on a white background. The only white background in your tank is either brand new dry rock or a bleached out coral skeleton. Easy to pick out these guys here. Note that they're very small. Now let's look at them in a real life setting because this is a real life reefing with Mr. Saltwater Tank, that's an Acropora flatworm on a piece of Acropora. Zoomed in a lot with markers to show you where those buggers are. They blend right in. They are hard to spot. You're very likely not gonna catch this with your naked eye. A bit of a magnifying glass is going to help you. If you see this on your tank, on your coral, on your Acros, that means you have Acropora flatworms and at that point, it's way down the line. Now, yes, this is easy to diagnose, but if you see this, look, you're in into this probably at least 14 days, if not more. And if you look in this picture in that dark spot where the branches are, over there kind of down to the right, that is a big old bunch of egg clusters, which means you've really got an acroporty flatworm problem. The good thing about acroporty flatworms are, unlike a lot of things in the saltwater aquarium world, we have data. We have actually data around these guys. So we know a fair amount about them thanks to hobbyists like you. A couple of years ago, there's a Kickstarter called the Acropora Eating Flatworm Project. Some researchers got together. Hobbyists gave them money. They got their research started and it's still going on today. This is a great success story. 
of hobbyists voting with their dollars and then us getting a lot back for our money in the terms of data with these nasty creatures called act reporting platforms. So here's what the data says. This is not anecdotal stuff. This is real life, scientific, peer proven, peer reviewed data. The eggs take six to 16 days to hatch. It depends on temperature. You depend, so, but six to 16 days is the average. Juveniles can swim. How about that? Swim to other corals. And these guys can live up to nine days without a host. The host being acropora coral. So if you take all the acros out of your tank, those boogers can live up to nine days. All right. Now, why you don't want acroporting flatworms in your tank, if you have them already, or if you've seen this in your tank, here's the thing. I've seen plenty of thriving SPS tanks with acroporty flatworms. So I don't tell you that so you go, oh, forget it. If I get it, no big deal. He said that he's seen tanks that are thriving that have acroporty flatworms. The point is, if you see one in your tank, if you have a brown break of them, it doesn't mean you immediately need to tear everything down, throw all your corals away, and then throw, give up. Not necessarily. I, but it's still, though, you, that doesn't mean you want to get them. All right. So let's move on about acroporting flatworms for a minute. I'm going to talk to you more about them when we talk specifically about coral quarantine tanks. There's people on this webinar who are not acro people, but who are softy people. And you may be thinking, see, that's what happens when you get SPS. You got to deal with acroporting flatworms. If you're a softy person, you're not alone, as I said earlier. You get these nasty little things called zoanthidine nudibranchs. There's one right there. Now, here's the thing about zoanthidine nudibranchs. Whatever they eat, they uptake the colors of that coral. This looks like a bunch of eagle eye zoas. That zoanthidine nudibranch um, doesn't eat, look too far off uh, the eagle eye zoanthids that they're eating. Therefore, they blend in. They are hard to notice, but here's the catch about this photo why I put it in there. The easiest time to see them is at night and when the coral is closed up. Notice a lot of these zoas are closed up. If you want to check your coral for zoanthidine nudibranchs, if you don't see them with your naked eye, touch the coral, get these zoas to close up, and then you can examine them. Here's another shot of one up close. They look like kind of fuzzy, woolly looking guys. That's what you're looking for. And if you see this, this is an egg cluster of zoanthidine nudibranchs on a zoa that's closed up. So if you see those, you know you got them. Now you need to go into triage here. They can easily take down a big coral like this. This is a Montipora coral, but we also have Montipora nudibranchs. They look like this. They hang out on the underside of the coral. So we have those as well. Another thing to keep an eye out for. Now, red bumps. Back to it, an Acropora type pest. These guys are barely seen with the naked eye. You can see them if you know what you're looking for. If you stare at a piece of coral long enough, you'll see little red things moving around. They look like fleas. Then you know you have them. One big giveaway if you have them on your coral is they don't have much polyp extension. Now, I say this with caution because I've seen plenty of beautiful acro tanks. Then the acros don't have a lot of polyp extension and they don't have red bugs, but they're still growing fine. So just because you don't have polyp extension doesn't mean you have red bugs. But if you think you do, and you don't have any polyp extension, then start looking for red bugs because it could be a giveaway. They really like to hang out on smooth skinned acropora corals. All right, so what do we do about most of these pests I talked about tonight? <clears throat> Dipping them does a lot of good, except when it comes down to the egg capsule. Now, what I'm going to recommend is whenever you put a coral into your tank or your, or, or your quarantine tank, you dip it, and while you're running your quarantine on your coral, you dip it multiple times. I'll talk about how much in a minute. So that's one type of prevention when it comes to coral quarantining is dipping. The other one is natural prevention. There's gotta be natural predators for this stuff out on the reef, otherwise it would take over, and that's how nature exists. You have a pest and then you have a predator, everything lives in balance. Now, the Milanaris rats, this is a photo of one this is one that people used to like to keep in their tank. It's still done. I hear about it some. People feel like it is a pest eater. My experience with them is, and my experience with people who have had some of those acroporting flatworm in their tanks is that these guys won't eat any flatworms or nudibranchs off the coral until you blow them off. You have to base them off, irrigate them off. Once they go flying in the water column, then these guys will eat them. All right? 
They're not going to eat the, the pest off the coral. You have to dislodge the pest from the coral. Then these guys may go after it. Now, back to the data about Acroporidae flatworms. Because we have data about Acroporidae flatworms, I just did an interview last week with a researcher on the paper. Peppermint shrimp and six line rastas were both proven to eat Acroporidae flatworms from the coral itself. Now, there's a catch here. Six line rastas had no interest in the egg capsules. Zippo, none, as Jonathan Barton, the red researcher, said in the webinar. So they don't eat those, but they do eat the worms themselves. They have very good eyesight. They will eat the worms off the coral. The peppermint shrimp ate the worms, and they ate the egg capsules as well. So both of these guys are natural predators. The catch with peppermint shrimp that I tell anyone is, if you just put a couple in your tank, for example, in this 100-gallon tank, that's going to put peppermint shrimp in here to deal with. Acroporidae flatworms or Aptasia, I would put at least 20 in there. You're not going to put two of them in your 100 gallon, 90, 120 gallon tank and get anything done. Now, six line rasp, that's different. Those guys are very territorial. Very likely you're not going to be able to put more than one in your tank because they kill each other. All right. So, your cool coral quarantine tank, it's got to be completely separate from your display tank. It's not a frag tank plumbed into your system with the filter stock on the output of the coral tank. That's not quarantine. Remember what we said at the beginning of the hour. There's quarantine and it's completely separate. Keep everything away. Nothing gets in, nothing gets out. It's got to be separate from your display tank. It also needs to be a clone of your display tank. This is especially true with coral quarantine tanks. I can't stress this stuff enough. This also makes it a little bit more complicated than fish quarantine. You need to have reef capable lighting. Here's some big on-the-road experience I've found with coral quarantine tanks. Match the same lighting that you have on your display tank. That means if you're running LEDs, run the same LED on your coral quarantine tank. If you're running T5s, run the same T5 setup. Not necessarily how many bulbs, but the same color, the temperatures of bulbs that you choose. So if you have an eight-bulb setup on your big display and you have a two-bulb setup on your coral quarantine, match the bulb types that you run. Some people like to run blue plus, purple plus, uh, coral blue spider, whatever it is. You want to match these things, make it the same. That way, when you take a coral out of quarantine and you put it in your display tank, the lighting is the same. There's no acclimating them to the lighting. It's all the same thing. Also, water chemistry is important when it comes to coral quarantine. Another thing to do is to match your coral, your coral quarantine parameters to your display tank. I'm really talking about alkalinity. If you're on your display at 9, 9 dKH alkalinity, do the same in your coral quarantine tank. Make the things the same, so when it comes time to take things out, you can easily pull it out. Now, you may be taking coral from your display tank, putting it in your quarantine tank if you want to treat it. Again, it makes it easy to go either direction. Just remember, if you're moving coral out of your quarantine tank, it's because it's at the end of a quarantine period and it passed, then you're putting it in. Flow is also key. We're dealing with corals. Again, it's got to be a clone of your display tank. Similar flow in your coral quarantine tank that you have in your display tank. You're probably going to need a dose. You're going to need to pay attention to water parameters, and you're very likely going to have to do water changes. Here's my experience with coral quarantine tanks, especially for SPS. It's trickier than running your display tank because it's very likely low nutrients. It's a smaller system, most likely. You're probably going to get parameter swings. So just keep that in mind. You want it to be a clone in every way that you possibly can. Now, let me put this in mind because people always mix this up. Say you have the Radiar, Radion XR30 on your display tank. If you have a small 20-gallon coral quarantine tank, you don't have to put the same XR30 over that quarantine tank. An XR15 will do. But it's the same light. You're going to be running the same schedule, the same um, temperatures, all that you want to match. All right. In your coral quarantine tank, ideally – no fish. Now, I give this is a little tricky for me, especially now with the data coming out of the Acroporidine flatworm project with that six line rasp that will eat Acroporidine flatworms and probably other coral pests as well. I would probably put a six line in my coral quarantine tank, knowing first that I fully quarantined it and I prophylactically treated it against diseases. I used to say that look, there's a chance that a piece of coral could carry in a fish disease. That's very likely very low. 
it's low enough for me that knowing the benefits of a six line in my coral quarantine tank, I would go ahead and run it. I'm going to have two to three peppermint shrimp. And if I have a bigger quarantine, coral quarantine tank, look, then I would have more. I'm going to be doing weekly dips. The coral is going to be coming out. I'm going to be dipping them. And while I'm dipping them, and then afterwards, I'm going to be inspecting them with a magnifying glass. I'm looking in nooks and crannies for any coral pests. If it's zoanthids, I'm touching the zoa so they close up so I can look for nudibranchs. I'm irrigating it. I'm blasting the coral with the dip water while the dip is going on. And then everything is held in the coral quarantine tank for 60 days. It doesn't get out of there until it's past my 60-day coral quarantine period. Don't be in a rush. And when you rush things, if a pest gets through, it's a much bigger problem than the time it's going to take you to stock up your tank. Now, that doesn't mean that you need to put one coral in your quarantine tank, nothing else, and then it goes through the quarantine period, and then you get to put another coral in your quarantine tank. You can have multiple corals in there. You can have multiple coral types. That's fine. For example, here's a cool little quarantine tank that I ran across on my travels. It's got a light on there. This is an Orfec light, fully capable reef light. He's got water change setups on this thing. He's got flow going on in there. You can see the water blowing around. He's got a zoanthid spray down on racks. He does dips on this. It's a fun little quarantine tank. It's only about 20 gallons. Let's watch that again. Um, you can see he wrote on there he's running at 8.1 dkh this is not a big setup but it worked for the guy this is actually underneath his staircase i was impressed i'm like wow you're pulling it off he's got a little hang on back filter on there as well this doesn't have to be overly complicated but it's working really well for these guys those are some nice soas i would love to have some frags out of them so it's there it does a good job it doesn't have to be complicated but it does need a clone of your system as much as possible. At the end of the day, we would love to have this as our display tank. Protect your investment. I know people spend a lot of money on coral. I have no problems with that, but if you're going to be putting that money dollars into your coral investment, do your job, do your homework, and protect what you got. It is very heartbreaking to have any type of tank, softy tank, acropora tank, mixed reef, and then you notice you have a pest in there because if there's one, there's likely more. Then you're like, how big is this in my tank? How overrun is my tank? I would love to get that new designer coral, but now it might get infected and get eaten up by these pests. You don't want to go there. Ah, uh, fish. The mind is pointing. The fish that I can have in my new tank, because I don't have the dotty back anymore, it kills them. All right, fish. I know there's some fish only people with us tonight, and those of you with who are mixed reefers, reef junkies, I'm sure you have fish in your tank. Why are you quarantining your fish? To keep diseases out of your display tank. You also want to treat an affected fish. If you buy a fish that's sick, then you want to quarantine it so you can treat it. Here's the thing. Quarantining in your display tank doesn't work. Treating the fish in the tank doesn't work. That being said, here's one of the big, big reasons besides diseases that I love quarantining. is to get up close and personal with your fish. Get the fish used to you and you want to get used to them. This is a time for you to work one-on-one -on, -one on them. This is a single date, this isn't a group date, this is you and that fish. Imagine going on a date with someone you have an interest in, and there's all these other people in the room. It might work on reality TV, but it wouldn't work for you. You'd be like, excuse me, hello, I would like some attention, or you're in there pushing people away, hogging all the attention. Big area with this is food. And your so put yourself in this shoes. You're out traveling. Back when we could travel, you're out traveling. You go to a foreign country. You just got off the plane. You're hungry. You say, you know what? I'm going to go find myself some food. And hopefully, you don't do what a lot of Americans do: is go look for a McDonald's or a Burger King or a Starbucks. Enjoy the local flavor. Okay. You're hungry. You go look for some food. You sit down in a restaurant. You order what you think is something safe, and they throw this at you. You go. You're kidding me, right? I mean, I think that's rice, and then it looks like a leaf of something, but those are bugs. I've never seen that before. I don't know if I want to eat that. Not so much. Here's a hint for you. It's the same way with your fish. You get them into your tank. You throw food at them. It's very likely a food that they haven't seen before. They're going to go, what's that? I don't think I'm going to eat that. Now, here's a hint. Here's some gold for you. 
if you're buying that fish from a local fish store, you can also do it online. Ask them what they feed the fish. And if you're buying it at your local fish store, ask for it to be fed. If they say that we just fed, fish will always eat. Ask them to feed again. Watch to make sure the fish eats and watch to see what they're feeding. Get the same food that that fish is used to eating. Buy some of it, have it around. Even if you're only going to use it twice, because then you're going to get the fish under your food, still have it just in case. Check this out. This is a fish coral, fish coral, a fish quarantine tank, one of mine. What are all the components? I'll get to that in a minute. I don't want you to focus on that. What I do want you to focus on is there a minus 20 and there's a sunburst anthias. Sunbursts are very timid fish. That being said, it's not so much about the sunburst, it's about there's nothing else in this tank. It's these two fish cruising around and that's it. There's no competition, there's no aggression. It's great for shy fish and it's great for aggressive fish as well. Give them a nice place to hang out, chill out, give them what they're used to and then get to know them. All right, contrast this with getting a new fish, putting it in your display tank. It's stressed because it just got transported. It doesn't know if these other fish in the tank are there to kill it or beat it in a submission because it doesn't know where it fits in pecking order. Then it, you're going to put this weird food at it and say, here you go, here's a traffic jam. Have at it. You got all these fish that are used to eating. They're going berserko because they know it's feeding time. This new fish isn't used to them. It doesn't know who's a friend or a foe. Then you say, you know what? Amidst all that, go with this food that you haven't seen before. Yeah, how likely is that to happen? Not very likely. Okay. One big reason I like to quarantine is to get to work with them in the area of food and routine. <clears throat> this is what I feed my fish. A couple notes here. <laughs> the brine shrimp. This is really just there to get picky eaters to start eating. And here's some more insider information for you, something I learned by actually going through this. I like to bring in live brine when I'm bringing in the fish. It helps them eat. I found most fish were very likely eat live brine, so it's a great way to get them to start eating. Now, I buy a lot of my fish from places that, can, that condition them for me, so they're already eating. But if you're buying fish from a wholesaler, you're buying it from a local fish store, I like to have live brine around. Uh -huh, at least have frozen around. Brine shrimp really isn't that nutritious for fish, especially the adults, and most fish won't eat the juveniles. So it's just there to get them eating. Then I'll move them on to more nutritious foods like pea mysis and the LRS, the fish frenzy, the coral frenzy, herbivore frenzy, doesn't matter what. Really like the LRS stuff. I've been using it for years and years and years. Another reason to quarantine your fish, with fish on the fringe, how is this fish going to react in your tank? It gives you a little bit of an idea. Angelfish, one of these fish that we would all love to keep, a lot of us won't. This is the flagfin angel, by the way. It has a reputation for eating coral. One way to see if they're, how they're going to react around the coral that's in your tank is to quarantine them, get them through the fish quarantine, and then put them in a separate holding tank with coral in it and see what happens. If they mow down your coral, you go, Okay, that sucks because I would have liked to have that fish in my tank and I just quarantined it. But it's much easier to catch in this little tank than my display tank. Even if your display tank is 55 gallons, it's much easier to catch a fish in a smaller tank with not much in it than it is your display tank. Also with other fish on the fringe, trigger fish, maybe they're going to eat your, your shrimp. Only way to find that out is to put them in a tank with a shrimp and see what happens. Any fish is an investment. Certainly what you have in your tank is that you put a lot into the tank and what's in there is a big investment. Taking a little bit of time to see how these guys react in a quarantine tank will be much worth it. And even small fish are an investment. It's another great time to work with them to get them to eat and to see if they are going to eat. For example, this mandarin here. Some of these guys will eat frozen food, but you're not going to know that if you throw them in your busy display tank with all that traffic and go, <clears throat> let's see if this guy is going to eat. Especially with the mandarin, they're very picky. They're very likely not going to eat. But in this quarantine, you can see what they'll eat if they'll eat anything that's prepared. And then you get them used to it. So when you go put them in the traffic jam, they're like, oh, I, this is food. I've seen this. I'm hungry. I'm going to eat. All right. Protect your investment. Whether it be fish, whether it be coral. Once disease gets in, even my holding tank or a tank like this, 
that's a problem. So let's talk a bit about fish disease because it's a huge area that I see lots of hobbyists make big mistakes. A huge reason to quarantine <clears throat> is to keep disease out. Now this is a golden basslet. This fish has ick. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. Again, the three amigos. There's three big usual suspects that you're most likely going to encounter when it comes to fish disease. The first one, marine ick, also known as cryptocurrent irritants. Some people just call it crypto, which is arguably the most common um, disease for marine fish. And it's the one that hobbyists get wrong the most. On the forums, I see people make this mistake all the time. You're here to be smarter and better hobbyists. So I'll help you make prevent from you making this disease, making this mistake. All right. First of all, what does it look like? It looks like these little pinhead dots all over the fish. This fish has a pretty bad outbreak of it. Here's the thing about it. Sometimes the fish gets a little bit of sand on it or dust type of things on it. If the fish has it, it's not going to be there in the morning and then gone by midday. So don't get caught up on that. It's tricked me a couple of times. I'm like, oh, it's got ick. But no, it's just a piece of something blowing around your tank that happened to stick to the fish. So it's all over their eyes. It can be on their eyes, on their body, on their fins. This is what ick looks like. Here's the part where a lot of people get wrong. Here's the life cycle. This is what's important. One of the key important parts about the life cycle. It's Ick is a parasite. It lives off a host. It needs a host to live. So when it's on the fish itself, it's called a trophon, and it's on that fish for three to seven days. Then it falls off the fish as it's part of a natural life cycle. It didn't fall off the fish because it died. It fell off because that's part of what it does. And then it falls off and it sits on somewhere in your tank, whether it be a rock, sand, side of your tank, a filter. It goes and insists, and then when it's in there, it starts reproducing. And then once it's done reproducing, the cyst breaks, all the little swimmers fly out, and then they start looking for a fish to latch onto. The free swimming stage lasts from 24 to 48 hours. So then it goes back out looking for another host, it latches onto your fish, and this whole process starts over again. What people mess up is they go, hey, my fish has ick, and then the next day, a lot of it or all of it is gone, and they go, the fish is cured. I didn't do anything. Or worse, they go, I fed garlic, and that cured my fish. The fish isn't cured. The disease is still in your tank. It's just going through your life cycle. So keep this in mind. If you see someone making this mistake, please correct them. Don't make it yourself. If your fish has it one day and doesn't have it the next, that doesn't mean it's cured. It means the disease is in your tank reproducing to go right after that fish. Now, fish can develop immunity to it, and there's evidence of fish carrying the disease and not showing any symptoms, kind of like COVID-19. People can carry it and they never know. So just because the fish looks healthy and has never had it doesn't mean that it doesn't have it. Hence, another reason to quarantine. We'll talk about prophylactically treating in a minute. All right, marine velvet, the silent killer. This is what I got in my tank, my 225, my 235, the knockdown all these fish, the one I call the silent killer. Nicknamed velvet or eudinium, it is a very, very effective killer. If you have fish that are there one day and then gone the next, Velvet is the first thing that's on my mind. It happened to me. It happened to a client of mine fairly recently who didn't quarantine. He had all these fish. And then the next day, we were just falling like flies. Like three were gone. Two were gone. Then the next day, one was gone. But then the next day after that, four were gone. They're just falling nowhere. And the really heartbreaking thing about velvet is you very likely don't see it on the fish. The fish is just dead. It's just gone. You're like, what the heck? He was eating. Now he's gone. Here's a really heartbreaker thing about Vel. This is my marine clownfish with very much infected with marine Vel. What does it look like? It looks like the fish got hit with powdered sugar. It looks bigger, like pinheads. Velvet looks like he got hit with powdered sugar. Very, very fine. And usually you don't see it on the fish. If you do see it, like I did, in a way you're lucky because then you know what the fish has. You're not just scratching your head going, I wonder why all these fish are dying. If you see it, you know you have it, a really heartbreaking, a heartbreaker, the really, 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 this is the third time I've said it, thing about velvet is, if you see it on the fish, it's very, very, very likely too late. The fish is gonna die, there's nothing you can do. 
the best thing you can do is go, okay, now I know what I have. Then I can do it. The life cycle of velvet is very similar to ick, but check this out. The parasitic stage can be as little as 12 hours. It is a very effective killer. Why? Because it moves much quicker than ick. Things fall off after as little as 12 hours. Then they insist in as little as two days. Then they're back out there again looking for stuff. So it can take down fish very quickly. You're probably not going to see it. Now, if you're watching all this going, what do we do about it? I'm going to get to you that, hang on, you got to know what you're looking for first before you can diagnose it and treat it. Brooknella, also known as brook or clownfish disease, is very common with clowns, especially wild caught. These days, there's very little wild caught clownfish coming in. I don't see it very often anymore, but here's what it looks like so you know. This guy looks like he has white patches on him or his skin is sloughing off. It's very different looking than marine velvet. This guy doesn't look like he has marine velvet to me because they're fairly uniform patches here. Velvet looks very different. The fish is going to be swimming around like this if it has velvet. If it had that much velvet on it, it would be on the bottom dying like my clown fish. Brook looks like this. So you know. All right, so the big ones, marine egg, marine velvet, brooknella. That's what you need to mainly keep an eye out for. There are other ones, but look, these are the big ones you're going to see by a huge margin. So we got to know why we're quarantined. We've talked about that. we got to know what we're looking for. We talked about that. Now we have to talk about how to quarantine your tank. You're going to need a tank to do it. And no, your display tank is not a quarantine tank. A tank tied into your display tank, like this one, there's a little pipe there draining from the sump into this tank. This is not a quarantine tank. This is a holding tank, but it's not a quarantine tank. Simply putting another tank into your system is not a quarantine. Disease can get from this tank into your display tank because it's all plumbed together. So it's completely separate from your display tank. We talked about that at the beginning, that's part of what quarantine is. The thing is, you don't have to have a huge tank. The catch here is if you have big animals. <clears throat> 20 gallon high works great. I've used those for years. If you have a fish larger than four inches or a fish like a yellow tang, anything other than a bristle tooth tang, those fish like to swim around. Look, a 55 gallon is great. A 40 gallon breeder is a nice intermediate sized tank. This is a 40 gallon breeder. It's only three feet long. It's 18 inches front to back, and I think it's 18 inches tall. It doesn't take up a lot of space. It has my stripes in there. Just remember those guys. And a cleaner mass in there as well. Now, what are all the components? I'm going to walk you through it. Here's another quarantine tank. It's got a couple things. Let's walk through First, PVC pieces. It's there to let the fish hide. Let them be comfortable. The more places that fish have to hide, the less they actually will. But give them a hole. See lots of quarantine tanks with no PVC in there at all, nowhere for the fish to hide. That animal is likely going to be more stressed out because he doesn't have anywhere to go. There's nowhere for him to hide. Now, the thing about these PVC pieces is you got to keep it in mind. If you have small fish, you can get by with the inch and a half. -ers. If you have a big fish, if you have a larger angel, and you put a little inch and a half PVC piece in there, it's not going to do anything for them. You got to have some big ones. So PVC pieces work great. What about rock in a quarantine tank? I get this question a lot. We know for about ick and velvet that part of their life cycle is to fall off the fish and insist on something. And some people would say well, rock just harbor diseases. It's a give and take for me. Personally, PVC pieces work great. So I don't feel the need for rock. If I had rock in my quarantine tank, once the tank was treated, I would go ahead and treat the disease, uh, treat the tank with the medication. That rock would stay in that tank forever. It's my quarantine rock. Personally, PVC is just easier to sterilize. It's easier to break down because, yes, you can do that. I'll talk about that in a minute. It works really great for me. Just keep the size in mind. Okay, next thing, filtration. These little hang-on back penguin filters work great. There's not much to them. You can get them anywhere. And you can easily add media to them like carbon if you need to run it. So the thing is, those things don't provide a lot of biological. We'll talk about that in a minute. But they work really well for quarantine tanks. You don't have to have a protein skimmer necessarily. You don't have to have all this crazy flow or all this crazy lighting. 
but I do recommend you have some kind of lights. Lights will help bring the fish out. I have found that tanks that are not lit, even with a simple fluorescent light, which I'll show you in a minute, they don't come out as much. Case in point, back down here, I have an old tank <coughs> that is housing a Harley Quinn Tusk. There's no light on this tank. The only light is a room light that I usually don't turn on because this room gets a lot of natural light. Despite the fact that it gets a lot of natural light in here, this tusk is nowhere near as active as when I turn on the room lights. So some kind of light works. You don't have to do anything fancy. All right. Filtration and quarantine. I said biological filtration is limited. But there's not much biological surface area in a hang on back filter, but it's better than nothing. Therefore, you want to feed. I harped on you earlier about why I like to quarantine. One of them is to get the fish to eat. Yes, you want to feed them, but you don't have to go bazonkers. I know some of you like to feed heavy. There's not a lot of biological in quarantine. If you feed heavy, then your nutrient levels can run up very quickly. Worst case, you have an ammonia spike, and then you're going to likely have fish death. All right? Be ready for big water changes in a fish quarantine tank. It's just part of it. Expect that. As I said earlier, quarantine is a contact sport. Okay, what about the bottom of the tank? There's no sand. Do I like to sand in the, in the quarantine tank? I don't, unless I have certain type of fish. I'll talk about this in a minute. I don't run any sand in the quarantine tank. Bare bottom, it's just easier to sterilize the system that way. It's easier to knock off diseases. I don't run sand in there. If I do run sand in there for certain fishes that I need to quarantine, like my two potter grasses, uh, which are actually over here in the holding tank, what I do is I get a Tupperware, put some sand in it. The animal that wants to sleep or hide in the sand will go in there, and it gives them a safe place to hide, but you don't have to put it all over your corn, your fish quarantine tank. So this is an easy way to quarantine sand drillers, because I do recommend that you do that. Here's how you get it done. All right. You need a heater in your quarantine tank, because it has been proven that the warmer that it is, the disease spreads and speeds up its life cycle. So keep it between 80 and 81 degrees Fahrenheit. It speeds those diseases along. You do need a heater, but lights, going back to this, you don't have to have anything fancy. This is like this freshwater, cheapo, you know, you can, this could be a fluorescent light out of your, your house. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. It just has to be a light. Light is very important. It brings the fish out and lets them see the food and it lets you see them. You're not going to notice that the fish has a fish disease or not if you can't see the fish and observe the gut. So put some kind of uh, light in there. Now, what about this water and the biological filtration? How do you get this thing started? Here's another area that I see tons of people make lots of mistakes and a lot of advice. Now, assuming your display tank is clean, and it should be because it's your display tank, you can easily use the water that you take out of your display tank from, and during a water change to fill up your quarantine tank. It's a great way to get the bacteria and biological process started in there. You can also use tap water, right? You don't have to use RODI water for your fish quarantine tank. You do want to dechlorinate it, but you don't have to use RODI water if you don't want to. Cheapy salt. Fish don't care about calcium levels. They really don't care about alkalinity. They don't care about magnesium. So you don't have to buy a reef salt. You can buy the cheapest salt that you can find, make sure it mixes up to the right salinity, but you don't have to go overboard. Another way to inoculate the tank, your quarantine tank, with nitrifying bacteria is leave a sponge or a bio well filter sitting in your sump. You can just leave it in there because your display tank is clean. When you need to get your quarantine tank going, you can fill it up, put that sponge in there once the salinity temperature is right in your coral, in your fish or coral quarantine tank, and then you can go with it, all right? The myth is that your quarantine tank has to be up and running at all times. Simply not true. I when I'm done with a coral when I'm done with a quarantine tank, a fish coral, it's getting late. A fish quarantine tank. I know I'm not going to have another group of fish in for over three weeks. I just break the thing down. I drain it, I sterilize it, and put in a little bit of bleach in there. I wipe it down, and then I store it away. Either it sits in place. Or for those of you that are space constrained, you can put it in your garage, put it in the closet. You don't have to have your fish quarantine tank up and running at all times. You can very easily inoculate it with bacteria from your tank for the water change. 
with a sponge or bio oil filter, or you can buy the bacteria in a bottle. I like the Fritz uh, Turbo Set 9 or the Dr. Tim's one and only. All right, so how long should you quarantine your fish? For me, it's 30 days. How did I come up with 30 days? Remember these charts from earlier? Because this life cycle is about 30 days. Remember, we're running the temperature warmer to help speed this along. Same with marine velvet, it's about 30 days. 30 days is my minimum time in fish quarantine. All right, so once I get a new fish, what do I do with it? The first thing I do is I acclimate it to my quarantine tank. I have a video out there on how to acclimate your fish correctly, check your salinity, pH temp, and adjust accordingly. I'm not gonna bust through all that. Just go watch the video. It's over on saltwaterchrome.com. Uh, we made a whole video on how to quarantine it. I did that interview with Laura Simmons, who's been in the saltwater aquarium, I mean the hobby. She's a professional for over 25 years. She knows her stuff. After I talked with her, I changed my whole quarantine process, my whole acclimation process, excuse me. So first acclimation to my quarantine tank. Now my display tank, my quarantine tank. Then I put the fish in my quarantine tank and I let them settle in. Settling in means usually day one, I don't try to feed them. I will turn the lights off, leave them alone. Don't go like grab them with your hand and try to take a picture of them. Just let them chill out. They've had a long journey. Even if they just come from your local fish store, they got chased with a net, put in a bag, drove in a car, and then put in this new tank. Let them hang out. Then I want them to start eating. Once they are eating, then I will freshwater dip the fish. I'll talk about that in just a minute, how to do that. I like to freshwater dip the fish. Then you have a decision to make. Do you want to prophylactically treat these fish or not? What is prophylactically treating? It means treating the fish against the disease even if they don't show any signs. So how do you decide if you want to do this? It really has to do with how much risk are you willing to take? Because as I said earlier, there are documented cases of fish carrying egg and not showing any signs. So just because you don't see it doesn't mean that it's not there. Prophylactically treating, when I prophylactically treat fish, I'm running them through copper. I'll talk about that in a minute because I really want to deal with marine velvet and I really want to deal with egg. So do you do it or not? If you want to give your fish the best foot forward, I like to do it. You want to dis dis protect your display tank as much as possible. Then I do it. So personally, it's always a given for me. And then after they're treated, I observe them. Once they're done with their medication treatment time, I sit back and I observe the fish. Are they acting all right? Are they eating? Are they putting on weight? Do they not have any of the diseases? You want to do that. All right. How? Let's go through freshwater dips. The thing about freshwater dips are they're harder than you when you do it correctly. They're harder on you than they are on the fish. So you're taking the saltwater fish and putting it in what seems like toxic freshwater and you're like, come on, baby. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. If you do it right though, it's actually very easy on the fish. Match the temperature between the freshwater dip and your quarantine tank. Match the pH between the freshwater tank, freshwater dip and your quarantine tank. Match those two things and then put the fish in the bucket or whatever you're dipping them in. I like to put an air stone down in that freshwater bucket and then start your timer. I like to do it for 10 minutes, no less than five, no more than 15. Here's where the fun part and the hard part for you is. You have to sit there and just watch. And ideally, a fish that's happy in a freshwater dip, if it lays on its side, that's okay. It means it's just chilling out. Most of the time, our fish swim around our tank, but when you're freshwater dipping and the fish lays down, you're gonna freak out. You're gonna be like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? This is the dumbest thing ever. I want to abort. Don't. If the fish is freaking out and trying to jump out of there, that's the problem. If the fish is just laying down, that's fine. Spend your timer for 10 minutes, hold what you got, let them get through the dip, and then put them back in the quarantine tank where they came from. All right. What about ick and marine velvet? Both of those, copper is my medication of choice. So the chem cupramine is what I use. I've had very good success with this medication. I ramp it up slowly. Here's part of my catch with cupramine. First day, it tells you to put in half the recommended dose. I put in half of the half. I start slow. I put a little bit of medication later in the afternoon. If I put it in the morning, then that afternoon, I check to see where it is. Very likely, I'm not going to get any reading on the test on the copper test. That's okay. And if you use CCAM cupramine, 
you want to use CCAM's copper test kit. If you use a different type of copper, you want to use the same test kit from the same manufacturer because different types of copper are made in different ways. One test kit for one type of copper might not work for another. So I'm going to test the next day. I'm going to add that other dose, the other half of the half. So if I added five mils on day one, I'm going to add five mils on day two. Maybe I start seeing a little bit of color change in the test. <clears throat> That's okay. I want this to come up slowly. I bring the fish up slowly. I found that I've had a lot of success with that. Then I treat for 14 days. 14 days once I get the medication to full strength. Here's the thing. Read the label on the medication for how long they recommend and what concentration the manufacturer recommends. Once you get the full concentration, run it for 14 days. Then you remove the medication either by adding activated carbon or doing a water change. And then observe your fish. What do you have? How is the fish doing? Is it still eating? Observation is a big part of it. So Icon Velvet is really what I'm after. That's how I handle Icon Velvet. <laughs> Let's look at a couple quarantine myths. One, quarantining is too hard on the fish. Absolutely false. If you do it correctly, it's easy on the fish because it gives them an easy transition into your tank. It lets them get settled in in their own little place, their own little hotel room. You get to give them room service. It's a nice, easy transition into the wrestle and bustle of your display tank. I love this one. It goes in every tank. It doesn't have to be. My tanks are started with dry rock, dry sand. Then I fill them with RODI water. Okay, No acre velvet or is going to ever live through that. And it is... It doesn't just get filled up all in one day with RODI water. It usually takes days on end. Then there's no fish in there for a while. Per se, it's sterile. There's no ick in there because it wouldn't add, it has to come in on a host. It's not like you can buy ick in a bottle and give it to someone as a joke. It doesn't work that way. Then I prophylactically treat my fish, and if you do that correctly, and that fish is clean, you put that in your tank, it doesn't have to be in there. It can be but it doesn't have to be. I absolutely do not believe that ick is in every tank. Here's another one. I love this one. There's no need to do anything about ick and velvet because we'll fight it off naturally. Really? Okay. Here's where this really starts to break down for me. Imagine you have a display tank. We'll use this one as an example. It's got some different types of fish in there. Maybe you see the fish that have had ick and then it went away and it only comes back under stressing events like if your heater breaks or your chili breaks, or something else happens. Then you get this new fish. It can be a cheap fish, it can be an expensive fish. You're looking at it and you go, okay, maybe you don't have ick, maybe you're immune to ick, maybe you can deal with it. But the only way you're gonna find out is to put them right in with the tank that has ick in it and go, let's see what happens. <clears throat> Nothing you can do. Literally just rolling dice, you're know, like the fish is either gonna get it and fight it off, in which case it's still in the tank or it's going to die from it, which sucks because then your investment is down the drain. So not a believer that the fish will just deal with it, especially if you're putting a stressed fish in a new environment where they're very likely not going to eat. They may get beat up because fish are in there throwing their weight around, establishing the pecking order. That's a prime time for Rick to come out. And that fish is in a weakened immune state, not the time to roll the dice and see what you get. By and far, the biggest takeaway with quarantining and keeping fish is the most expensive fish is a dead fish. If you pay more for a fish that's quarantined and conditioned, it is still way cheaper than buying two of the dead fish, dealing with all the other math, aftermath because of it. If you the fish dies because it had velvet, velvet or ick, now that velvet and ick is in your tank, velvet and Here's the really bad news. Everything is very likely going to die, or if not everything, a lot of them. Now you have in your tank, you just lost all your fish. If you have ick in the tank, now you've brought it in, or that fish is dead. It's way cheaper to prevent it and to deal with it in a quarantine tank and to buy pre-quarantined and conditioned animals than it is to simply keep buying cheap fish and they dying and then you're replacing them. By and far, the most expensive fish is a dead fish. All right, with that, Here's why I turn it over to you guys and gals to your live questions. Remember, we can do questions live. We can do questions on a chat as well. There's two ways you can ask them. If I call on you, 
raise your hands. Please tell your screaming children uh, to be quiet. Make sure you turn on your microphone so that I can hear you. And with that, let's roll over to some questions. Um, again, make sure you unmute your microphone. You're running into problems before. All right, Gideon M., you are on, Gideon. What is your question? You gotta unmute yeah. your mic there, buddy. There you go. Yep. The question I have is, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, Euromia, Euroma, uh, something that's mm -hmm. been popping up a lot. Your email. Uh, how do we how do we treat that um so your nema so when i have dealt i've actually never dealt with it um i actually haven't seen it I've, i hear people say that it's popping up a lot um freshwater dips i found can help with it i believe formalin um is a treatment protocol i have to look because you know i haven't seen it in so long it's passed out of my brain formalin if that is one careful with that because it, it can be known to cause cancer um, but I would take another look at your anema it may just be a stress animal that has a um, localized infection I've seen fish that look like they have it but they really don't um, but I believe freshwater dips and formalin uh, Gideon are the treatment for that it's just I haven't I've never dealt with it I haven't seen it in so long um, I'm not as up on that as I, I should be um, so double check that on me before you start um, a treatment protocol. Thanks for asking me the tricky question uh, to start out. Uh, that's a good answer. I'm going to write that down because I should know that, but uh, it just hasn't been around. I just haven't seen it. I don't know why everyone says they've been seeing it. I certainly have. All right, Luis A. Let's uh, let's go to you, Luis. Fire at will. Okay, can you hear me? I can. Okay. Uh, right now, I have a quarantine tank running right now. And um, last week, the water got very cloudy. Um, some of the biomedia had black spots. I have matrix in um, the biospheres. And the fish seemed to be getting stressed. So I did another water change. And, but this time, I added water from my display instead of like new salt water. And the water cleared up and the fish seemed okay now. So I didn't just know any ideas what was going on. How long was it from when the salt was mixed to when you put it in your tank? Overnight. Overnight? Okay. So that's, was it cloudy, the salt cloudy, the salt, new salt water cloudy when you put it in the tank? No, it wasn't. You know, I, I, I don't know. And then just these black spots are what got me concerned. It's like, what, what is all that? Just black, a lot of like really dark spots on the media. On the media? Mm -hmm. All right, so cloudy water in quarantine. A couple things come to mind with that. One is it can be a bacteria bloom, because as I said in the presentation, there's not a lot of biological in a quarantine tank. The fact that you use display tank water, you put it in the quarantine tank, can help diversify your bacteria. So you may have done a water change, stirred some stuff up. Um, also, maybe you knock down some biological. And then all of a sudden we have nutrients in a tank that doesn't have a lot of place for a biofilter. So that could have done it. So if you're having more success than you're not having clouding water by using your display tank water, I would keep using your display tank water. You can do 50-50 as well. Um, I'd also check your salt, make sure you're using a high quality salt. Some salts take longer to mix up. But you said overnight, that's a good amount of time to mix up your salt um, before you use it. But uh, it sounds like a bacteria bloom to me. Uh, that's what jumps out at me with that kind of cloudy water. Now, what's the black spots on the media? Um, I, you know, there's black spot ick. I don't think it's that. I wouldn't think that it's that. Certainly, if you did a water change with new salt water and all of a sudden it showed up, that may just be areas of um, potentially death of your biofilter. Um, so you can easily take that media out and rinse it off, see if it falls off. You said you had success with the display tank water change. I would keep going down that route. Great question. All right, Brandon S. Let's go to Brandon. We'll take some text questions after this. How about it, Brandon? Unmute yourself. There he is. Oh, can you hear me? I can. Uh, this was about your. Uh, it was about the freshwater dip, and you say you 
you uh, um, you know, you match the pH and stuff. What are you talking about? I mean, how are you raising the pH? Are you just dripping water in there? Uh, with a pH buffer. Oh, with a pH buffer. Okay, so you're just adding a pH buffer into it. Okay. Right. Now, the, the trick to that, Brandon, is it doesn't take very much to do it. Like it, it may, like a quarter of a teaspoon may be all you need. A lot of times when I first started doing freshwater dips, I would put in the teaspoon that it recommended and then the pH was sky high. So it doesn't take very much to do it. It's much easier to raise it than it is to uh, lower it. So that's how I do it. I also make sure I use a pH probe. Uh, I don't use a pH test kit. In fact, when I used to do it, um, I would just take my pH probe out of my apex, out of my display tank and put it down in that freshwater dip because uh, I was too lazy. Um, so I don't use the test kits, but you raise it with a pH uh, buffer solution. Okay. I, I, yeah, I watched your video um, earlier. You just you mentioned that lady. Um, I think it was in Australia. And I kind of had the same question when she was talking about it too. And I'm like, and I was like, oh, so I'm, I'm glad I got to ask. <laughs> Thank you very much. Please yeah, let me bring this up. Uh, um, yeah, it's, you can get it anywhere. A lot of, uh, um, freshwater stores um, will do it, will sell it. So it's a pretty easy uh, product to find. All right, Brandon, thanks for your question. Let me Thank bring you. this show up for, here we go. So here's the show that I did. I will make sure we share this in the link of the video. Um, I sat down with Laura Simmons there at Cannes Marine. Um, lots of eye candy there by the well. By the way, um, I sat down with her and did a talk, there's Laura, uh, about how to acclimate your fish. What I just do whatever she says. In terms of feeding, in terms of fish acclimation, once I talked to her, I went out and bought the, the salinity checker and the pH tester, and I follow this to a T every single time, whether it's fish, whether it's coral, whether it's inverts. You want to know how I do it, watch the video and do what she says. And they have, like I said, lots of nice, happy, healthy, well-fed fish uh, there in the background. It was a great experience, learned a lot from that one. That's how I do it. All right, let's go, let's send that next text question for you all. Um, let's see here. Let's see, inverts, I always get this question. Dana wants to know about inverts. Do you need to quarantine inverts? You said you had a velvet outbreak, sucks for you, buddy, a year and a half ago. Now I quarantine for every, everything for 60 days. So do you quarantine inverts? All right, great question. Because we know that marine velvet and ick, they fall off the fish and they have to insist on something and hermit crabs and snails have a hard shell. Yes, the disease could insist, could fall and insist on a shell of a quarantine of a hermit crab or a snail. Yes, it can happen. And insisting on an exoskeleton of a shrimp, not very likely, not going to happen on a live coral either. The coral would likely digest it. It's a pretty small chance that that would happen. It can happen. So do I quarantine my inverts? I don't because here's why. I buy them from a place that keeps the inverts separate from fish. I've walked into plenty of local fish stores, even some wholesalers, and they have their, corn, their fish holding system tied into their invert system, in which case a fish disease could get in with the inverts. If I was buying from there, yes, I would quarantine them. If it's a system if it's that's not tied in or a place that doesn't even sell fish, then it's such a small chance to me that I'm gonna say, okay, because I've done everything that I can do and that the two systems are not tied together with the fish and the inverts, or the place doesn't even sell fish, I'm willing to take that risk because to me it's very, very very small. If you want to quarantine your inverts, it's not going to hurt anything. They're likely going to do fine. It's not going to hurt you. Great question. Nick. Nick says he lives in an apartment. So he has a grow out system uh, to stock a future tank with when you have a house. Ooh, you already have a six line and a mix of corals. When you set up your permanent system, should I quarantine my current stock before putting them into the main system? The fish and coral were not quarantined. Great question, Nick. I'm asking myself, at times the same question with these guys, the fish and coral out of my old tank, am I going to quarantine them? Am I going to treat them again 
before they go into the display tank. Now, here's where I differ from you, Nick. These fish in here are prophylactically treated against diseases. So I'm pretty dang uh, common, or pretty dang confident that they don't have a disease because I started my tank with dry rock, dry sand, RODI water, and a prophylactically treating them, and I don't get any fish <coughs> and just put them straight in unless they've been pre-quarantined and pre-conditioned. So I feel like for me, that risk is pretty small. Now you said the fish and the coral were not quarantined. As I said in the presentation, we know that fish can carry it, but never show the signs. Coral may have it like those aggregate flatworms, even though zoanthidine and nudibranchs can be hard to see. So would you do it? Here's how I would look at it. Number one, you're building your dream tank. Even if it isn't the like end all be all dream tank, like you bought a house, this is the time for you to move into the next big system. I hope you're excited about it. I would certainly would be. This is your time to do it. If you're going to quarantine your stuff, do it now. If you feel like the fish are clean, if you've got them from somewhere that quarantines them for you or conditions them, then you may have more confidence that they are clean. If you didn't do any of that quarantine at all, you never had a disease in your tank, I would look pretty dang hard at quarantining them because you know that they could be carrying a disease and you not know it. Then the only way you're going to find out is one, <clears throat> you put them in your new tank. That's a bit of a stressing event for them. Then they get an outbreak and you go, well, there it is. They have it. <clears throat> now I know it's in my tank. Then the only way to get it out of your tank is to either A, tear down your tank and sterilize it, which was I did because the tank was practically brand new, or remove all the fish out of there for 60 days. I recommend 90 no fish in this brand new tank that you just built and treat them in the quarantine and then bring them back after that 90 days. <laughs> Meantime, you're staring at this big empty aquarium. Hopefully your spouse is supportive of your hobby. If not, just gonna be like, rip, rip, rip. and this flows both ways, ladies. Spouse is complaining that they spent all this money on this tank and it's sitting there empty because Here's the thing, your spouse probably doesn't care flip about the corals. They like the fish swimming around and you got no fish in there. So Nick, I personally would do it. That's how I would approach it. Uh, it's your decision. I hope that uh, you get to that house and get to build the dream system, the next system soon. Uh, it's a lot of fun when you get to make that move. All right, great questions. Let's see, let's go back to the live questions here. Who has a live Live, <clears throat> live, let's go to the top of the alphabet because you guys always get treated first. Oh, let's see here. All right, Darren, have at it. Darren B, make sure you unmute your microphone. You're on. Hey, how are you, Mark? Mark, can you hear me? There? I can. Okay, Mark, how are you? Hey, Mark, I was I'm asking a question. I was listening to you about quarantining your fish i just recently set up a 75 gallon with a 30 gallon sump and it's still cycling i probably have about another week left so my concern is is how do i go about taking everything from my 30 gallon that i already have that's been acclimated almost a year looking good water's good numbers are good to move and transfer and everything over and then i want to keep this 30 gallon as my quarantine tank so that's my question so are you planning on treating them or quarantining them before you put them in your 75 or are you just going with it? Well, that's what I was asking you. I mean, they've been in here. I don't see any bugs, anything. I've been pretty lucky. I had a, a, a lawnmower blending that got pretty aggressive, killed a few smaller fish. But besides that, my pistol shrimp and all that's doing pretty good. Had a few clowns, but I want to know the, the process of trans, transferring everything to the 75 gallon. So I'm still a little new at this. So that's why I follow you all the time and ask to be able to ask the questions. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks for the question there and thanks for the follow as well. How would you move everything over? Um, if you're gonna treat them, then you gotta take them out of the 30. Well, let me paraphrase that. If it's just a fish only tank, then you can treat them in place. But the fish treatment diseases like copper, that will absolutely kill inverts, absolutely nail them. It will send that right on the label. So if you have corals in there with your fish, especially if you have a grown out type of tank, the fish have to come out. Now, if you have just a couple corals, you can set up a nice little coral, coral uh, holding tank. 
you can separate them out, then you can treat their fish. So if you want to treat the fish, they've got to come out, or you got to take the coral out, then you treat them, and then you put them in your display. I would not move everything from your display, from your, cor your quarantine tank, straight into your display tank. So it wouldn't go from the 30 to the 75, or from the quarantine straight, all at once, everything into the 75. Now, disclaimer here, if it's 30 gallon tank, you probably don't have five tanks, I sure hope you don't, that you're gonna go put in the new system. You maybe have a handful of fish, <laughs> in which case, I'm not concerned about adding those fish to the new tank with the bio, in terms of a biofilter standpoint. To me, it's more about, are those fish gonna be aggressive against what you might want in your new tank? You talked about the, uh, the story of Blenny or the lawnmower of Blenny killing fish. Look, that might be time for you to get that guy out or put that guy in last. Another good reason the quarantine stuff is you can have it and you can go, well, you know what? You need to come in last. I'm going to hold you here and get other stuff in the tank before. It's going to depend on uh, what you have and then if you want to um, quarantine them before you put them into your tank. Again, that's you got to make that a call just like uh, the guy asked earlier. <clears throat> if you want to do that, they've been clean. You may be okay rolling the dice. Uh, that's something I can't answer for you. Personally, for me, it's just not worth the risk because I've been through velvet. I've watched it happen to me. I've watched the clients who didn't heed my advice. It's heartbreaking. It's not a lot of fun. Once it happens to you once, you will not want to do it again. All right, Marty. Marty R. Have at it, Marty. Make sure. There you go. Are you with us, Marty? Oh, you're unmuted, but I can't hear you, Marty. Oh, all right, Marty, why don't you uh, write your question in the chat window since uh, I can't uh, hear you here. All right, let's see. How are we doing here? Oh, we'll go this. We'll do two more lives, and we'll switch over some more uh, chats. All right, Robert Y., you are you're live, Robert. There you go. I mean, your mic, have at it. Hey, Mark, how are you doing tonight? I've well, got how are you, the, sir? Pretty good, pretty good. I major question tonight is the size of the quarantine tank. I've got a 30 gallon nano, and I was planning on a five gallon or two five gallon quarantine tanks to kind of double up on getting the fish in there quicker, but okay. still trying to get a bang for the buck. Um, I was actually looking at the Fluval Evo all-in-one saltwater five-gallon system. Okay. Good, good deal. And to try to, I don't know, like I said, just get the livestock in there quicker, but also do a full quarantine process. And once I get some fish in, then also switch over to maybe one for coral, one for livestock fish. Thoughts? So what size for a little 30 on uh, nano for quarantine. So the thing about five gallons, Robert, is it's, yeah, you have a 30 gallon tank. The fish that I would put in a five gallon tank, maybe that zebra blenny that we talked about in the first session, <clears throat> not a lot. I would not put a lot of fish in there. It's just gonna be easier for you to go get a 20 gallon, uh, at least a 10 gallon, like a 20 gallon high, because you're gonna have a hang on back filter that doesn't cost you a lot of money. It's not very big. And it works well for that tank. It fits on there. There's a big lid kit with it. There's a light kit for it. It's just going to be easier for you in the long run. Understand your tank is 30 and your quarantine is 20. You're just going to get a lot of mileage out of it. And it's not going to cost you much at all. The price between a five gallon tank and a 20 gallon tank is really negligible. So I wouldn't go too small on that, even though you're going to have a small tank. Um, I would still give yourself some space. The fish are certainly not going to complain about having extra space. And in terms of keeping water perimeters, like a 20 gallon tank is four times the size of a five. Just make your uh, just make your life easy. All right, <clears throat> safety stop. All right, Jeff has a question about safety stop. What are my thoughts on it? What does it do? All right, let's see if we can pull this up. In case you all don't know, oh, that's not going to be good. That's too broad of a. There we go. All right, here we go. This safety stop stop. What is this for those of you that don't know? So this is a two-part fish dip 
so to speak. Uh, it's got methylene blue on it. I think malachite green are the two um, parts of this. So what's my take on it? Is it better than nothing? Probably. I'm still going to quarantine. Am I going to use this instead of quarantine? No. Am I going to put my fish through this if I have quarantined them? No, because what this might take care of in a two-hour dip, I think it's 45 minutes each, so an hour and a half dip, you're going to handle that during quarantine as opposed to this. So if you're going to do nothing, which I don't recommend, at least do this. If you're doing a full quarantine, I'm not going to do this. Um, does it actually do anything? <clears throat> I haven't seen any data on it. Um, it seems like a good idea. I certainly don't think that it is a rapid fish quarantine. Quarantine your fish. It's worth it to you. That's what I think about. <laughs> All right. Great question, Jeff. Thanks for that. Let's see. Where do I buy my uh, inverts from? Do I trust them? All right. So I get inverts from a couple places, Dana. Uh, reef cleaners. Reefcleaners.org. I think he's still around. Should be. <clears throat> he's down in Florida. Aha. These guys don't sell fish. So there's no fish kept with the inverts. Very small chance that they have it. I also will buy inverts from Live Aquarius Diver's Den, not just Live Aquarius, from the Diver's Den. That's another place uh, where I get them. I have some wholesalers that I know keep them separate. I can buy from wholesalers because I have, um, you know, this is what I do for the business. The rest of the world can't. Um, so those are the places, but reef cleaners really takes care of most of the needs. What I can't fill with reef cleaners, uh, I fill over at Live Aquarius Diver's Den. All right. So let's see here. Oh, <clears throat> I love this question because <clears throat> I've tested it. Where did it go? Is it true? <clears throat> Tony wants to know, is it true that you can't use um, a copper tank for a display tank ever again? Absolutely not true, Tony. I have done this. I wrote about it in my quarantine book. I took a five gallon tank of all things. I put sand in it, I put rock in it, and then I nuked it with copper. <clears throat> I put like four times the recommended amount that you, recommend, that you dose fish with. There's no fish in there. I just ran the thing high up with copper, left it for a couple weeks with the idea that the sand or the rock would soak up the copper. <clears throat> then I removed the copper with the water change in with Cooper's Orb, that Seachem's copper absorbing media. Then I put coral in there. I put some zoanthids in there, and they did just fine. So you can use rock and sand that has been coppered. It's not like the copper gets into the seals on the tank and then it's hosed. I've heard that one too. You do have to remove the copper with a copper absorbent agent like cupramine. Now that being said, when I go in copper my display tank, no, if it has inverts because they're all going to die, but if I knew that I had large fish and I was putting rock in there that I was hoping going to use in my display tank, if I had no other option, then I might treat that rock and then put it in. For the most part, though, if I'm putting rock in my quarantine tank, I'm just leaving it in there because I'm not going to be moving rock back and forth between my display tank uh, and my quarantine tank. Maybe some small rubble pieces like this you might put in your sump. Use that to inoculate things. Um, but you're not going to take your big pieces of rock out of there for, uh, between your quarantine tank and your uh, DT. All right. Sam wants to know, a couple good sources for pre-quarantine uh, conditioned fish. And then what process would you follow before adding these to your display tank? All right. Two places I get them. One is... Live Aquarius Diver's Den, not regular Live Aquarius. You have to buy them over here from the Diver's Den. These fish are all pre-quarantined. They're all pre-conditioned, meaning that they've got weight on them. They're used to eating certain types of food. They're acclimated to frozen foods. That is one place um, where I get them. Another place that I will get um, pre-quarantined fish, more of the higher end fish, is over here from TSM Aquatics. If you buy from these guys, make sure you tell them I sent you. But look, <clears throat> these guys are selling some high-end stuff. Look, not all of us are going to go drop $1,800 on Abandoned Angel. So these guys tend to get um, the higher-end fish, but uh, they do a good job. I've been there. Just 
slowly. I've checked them out. Um, I trust both Livacoria. Livacoria has a much wider range, much more availability. Uh, the TSM guys I use more for uh, rarer type of fish, but either one of those are people uh, that I trust. And then what do I follow once I've gotten from these guys? I still get these fish because they're pre-quarantined, because I happen to trust those guys. I still put them in a quarantine tank and I observe it. I'll keep them in there. I want to make sure they're eating my foods. I want to make sure they're comfortable, used to my routines. They know when I walk in the room, I'm not going to eat them. They're not swimming away. I want them coming up to me and eating. That's all good signs to me before I put them in my display tank. Great question. All right, let's go back to uh, a live question here. And then uh, we're going to wrap it up. We've been with everyone for an hour and a half. All right, so I got to give it to the old guy up in uh, Canada, Simon. Uh, I won't let you be last because um, I'm, you get called on every week. You got uh, the questions you're on every webinar I've ever done, Simon. You're live. Hi, Mark. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? I'm very well. And I got to say, thanks for the shout out. I love all your webinars. They're really entertaining, they're informative, they're really great. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Yeah, you're very welcome. So my question is actually, um, you talked about doing large water changes during quarantine period. Uh, mm -hmm. What parameters would spur you on to do a large water change? And if you have to do a large water change halfway through running copper, let's say, do you have to pre-medicate the the fresh water going in, or do you just dump the new salt water in and then medicate the water? Because cupramine cannot drop, otherwise it's not therapeutic and the fish can get you know, reinfected. Right, so when I go to do a water change, what would make me do a water change is if my, really my nitrates are getting above 20 parts per million. Fish really don't care about nitrates. 20 is a good threshold for me. If you see any ammonia, over 0 0.2 uh, ppm, then I'm going to do a water change. Remember that if you're doing an ammonia test and it's 0 0.25, it likely just means that there's so little amount that there's some ammonia there, but all the tests it can do is tell you the reading for 0 0.25. If I say anything above that, then I'm going to want to do an immediate water change. Now, if I'm prophylactically treating the tank with cupramine, you do a water change and you're knocking down the medication level a concentration you want to keep it um, at the recommended level which I believe is 0 0.5 um, for that 14 days so how would I do that you can pre-medicate the water that's fine that's an easy way to do it because then you have control over it put some copper in in that case but like, you don't have to pre you don't have to ramp up slowly on pre-medicating the incoming salt water because there's no fish in it um, I would get it to the right amount, put in how much you think you need, a little less because it's easier to add more than it is to take it out, then do your water change. Now, if you do your water change with, for say, fresh salt water where there's no cupramine in there, as soon as that new salt water is in there, I'm immediately adding medication trying to get it back up. Look, if the, if the concentration is low for a couple hours, like five hours, I'm not concerned about it. I'm more concerned if it's you know, 12 hours, 24 hours type of things. Easiest way for you to do it though, is to simply medicate uh, the new water that's coming in. You've got no fish in there. You've got a lot of room for error. It's not going to cause a problem. And if you overdo it, then you just add in some more fresh salt water. You do a larger water change, which will help with your, your uh, nutrient, uh, your nutrient issue. That's why you're hopefully doing a water change. All right, let's take one last question here, and then we'll wrap it up for the evening. Oh, Jose. All right, Jose. You just went away. Where'd you go, Jose? Yeah, I think he, oh, I think he just gave up. I just called him, and he ran away. Kind of like my whole dating experience in high school. All right, so let's go into a couple of text questions here. Prozzy Pro. Ed wants to know about Prozzy Pro for quarantine. Great question, Ed. Do I use Prozzy? I haven't in the past. Um, I'm looking at doing it mainly with you know internal parasites type of things. I would probably start doing that as I'm starting to quarantine new fish uh, for the next tank. I didn't do it in the past, but yeah, I would start doing that now. 
I'm still only going to do it once the fish is eating. I want to get the fish into the quarantine tank. I want to get them eating for a couple of days. Then I'm going to start exposing them to medication. Great question, Ed. All right. Let's see here. <clears throat> last question. Who's going to be the last one? Who wants to? Da, 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 da. Let's see here. Is there any fish that I would not treat with quarantine? Or excuse me, I would not treat with cupramine. Great question, Douglas. All right. Some animals, per se, don't do well with copper. This is really smooth-skinned animals. If you're putting a shark in your tank, which I really hope that you're not, um, I'm very likely not appropriate. I'm not going to put the animal through cupramine. I'm not going to put an eel through cupramine. I'm not going to put a stingray through cupramine. That being said, I really hope you're not putting a shark or a stingray <clears throat> in your aquarium. Very likely it's not set up for them. Eels, it's very likely that those guys don't get them. So I'm not as worried about the eel bringing in the disease. Then it's more of a concern about something, the disease coming in with the water. So then if I was bringing in the eel, I would acclimate them. I would still quarantine them in the sense that I'm going to want them to eat, make sure they're comfortable. I'm then going to put them in a bucket, acclimate them to my tank, and try to get the eel out with as very little water from the bucket into my display tank. Um, <clears throat> other fish that I would not treat with cupramine. I have treated a lot of fish, including mandarins and sensitive wrasses. My potter wrasses, which are in there, sleep in the sand bed. They went through two weeks of cupramine. And I had great success with it, Christopher, because I ramped up very, very slowly. Five-day period to get my cupramine up to the recommended concentration. I'm okay with it taking a while. If the fish stops eating, they're start acting stressed, then I pull the medication. But I want to go slow. The only time I've had issues with cupramine or copper is when I'm dosed too fast. Great question. All right. Timothy wants to know about the tank <clears throat> transfer method. What is it? How does it work? All right, Tim, for those of you that don't know, tank transfer method involves having one or more, <clears throat> two or more uh, quarantine tanks. You put the fish in here. I believe it's every day, every two days max. Then you transfer the fish to the other tank, which is completely sterile. Sterilize your old tank that it was in, and then you transfer it back. So the idea is that the disease falls off the fish because that's part of its life cycle, like you learned about earlier. Then you're sterilizing the tank, the disease has no chance to insist and then hatch and then go back after the fish. So eventually the fish has shed all of the parasite as part of its natural life cycle. What do I think about it? All right, Tim. One, it's time intensive. And, and per se, it's equipment intensive. You gotta have two tanks, at least two, then the same equipment, you gotta be willing to sterilize them. And by the way, drying them out or filling them up with fresh water is not counting a sterilization. Adding bleach is how I sterilize things. You can put half a cup in 10 gallons and that will absolutely sterilize the tank. You have to be willing to do that <clears throat> every other day at the bare minimum. That takes a fair amount of effort and it also puts the fish through some amount of stress. Hopefully you're not netting the animal if you're doing that because that can knock down their slime coat. You want to catch them in a smaller container that way you don't have to touch them. I've had more success uh, with, given the success that I've had with Cupramine, I go that route. I, the tank transfer method can work, it's been proven to work. It's a lot of effort on you, it's a lot of effort on the fish. The people are like, I don't even know if I want to quarantine, tank transfer method uh, isn't gonna be for you, but it can work. Great question, Tim. All right, thanks everyone for being with us tonight. It is 10 o'clock. We've been together for an hour and a half. Thanks for giving me your time. Thanks for staying safe. I hope everyone is doing well on your quarantine period. Absolutely, quarantine your fishing for all is worth it. We want to have a great experience with the tanks. Take the time, do it, do it right. Make sure you watch the video over here with Laura about how to acclimate your fish into your quarantine tank or from your quarantine tank into your display tank. Learn how to do it, it's an easy thing to do. And it's a lot of fun to watch the animals knowing you're giving them the best leg forward by quarantining them and by acclimating them. Thanks everyone for being with me. I will catch you next week for the final session next Sunday, 8.30 p.m. Central. We will be back. Have a great night.